Um, this is what Kevin and I came up with based on the products we have downstairs and what we believe is a little bit more sustainable than the Square Foot Guardian Method soil mix. So I get to use that myself this year, so I'm pretty excited. But um, it's fully balanced, it's got everything it needs to provide for your plants. So I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so it looks like the room's pretty full, it's about the number I was expecting. So I think everybody should be here. If there's a few shoppers, you can just ask questions and, and catch them up. Um, so I'm going to cover three different topics today. Square foot gardening, companion planting, and greenhouse management. And each of them, I, des I decided to kind of give them more general use of each. And then in the questions section, we can discuss that more in depth. Because uh, I know that there's a wide array of expertise in the room. So I figured I'd start with the basics and we could grow from there. Gardening expectations. Everybody's been there. You see beautiful gardens on TV and in books and magazines and like that, you're like, I'm gonna garden. <laughs> it can't be that hard, right? Normally, this is our gardening reality. A lot of us end up looking at our gardens and shaking our heads wondering what went wrong. The crops are failing. Whatever produce we do get doesn't look as pretty as one sold in the store. We're on the brink of giving up our gardening dreams. And Virginia Clay certainly doesn't help that. But thankfully, there are three methods that you can use that I've already mentioned. Square foot gardening is the first one. Square foot gardening is an easy, viable solution for most backyard gardening problems. This method allows for greater production while using a significantly smaller space, which also increases the opportunity for growing more diverse gardening products. Whether practicing this method in conjunction with gardening methods you already have in place, or by starting completely from scratch, this method is tailored directly to fit your gardening needs. Companion planting is also an easy thing to incorporate into any garden program, but it's especially helpful with square foot gardening. By grouping certain plants together, natural insect pest management and growth promotion can be achieved, which reduces the need for non-native inputs. In one of the handouts that I gave you guys, it's a six-page companion planting guide, and I'll go a little bit more in-depth on that. Um, but I'm not going to cover all of it today, but certainly as I'm talking, feel free to look through there. And if there's anything that doesn't make sense or you'd like me to expand on, you can ask. It's just a compilation of other gardeners' findings. So there's no science backing it. It's just what other gardeners, gardeners have found to be effective. Utilizing a greenhouse to get a jump start on gardening is also a great benefit to your gardening program. For those of us in areas with temperamental weather, such as Virginia, the slightest temperature change can ruin our garden productivity. Greenhouses provide a longer growing season with a controlled environment and controlled production. There's many ways to build and use a greenhouse. Today, I'm gonna to primarily focus on starting seedlings for transplanting into your square foot garden. If you desire to use a greenhouse for the entirety of your gardening needs, such as you mentioned, there's wonderful online resources and books on the handout that I gave you uh, for more information on greenhouse management. The little tub that I'm passing around, which is wherever it is now, um, of soil, that is based on a mix that Kevin and I came up with. It has three bales of coir, one bag of vermiculite, four bags of organic compost, one bag of worm castings, and one ounce of EM1 per gallon of water. Uh, which this one does not have right now because it's, I'm not using it to plant yet. And also two pounds of planters too. Coir has many gardening benefits and is often used in place of peat moss. Coir is praised by hydroponic growers for its water retention, deterrence of fungus gnats and certain diseases, and its root supporting structure. Coir also effectively traps air in the soil, which benefits the plant roots, and maintains a pH of 6 to 6.7. Coir improves soil drainage in the garden bed while also helping to retain moisture in quick draining soils. There's some handouts back there, there should be five. So it's a free ground. Since coir does not add many nutrients to the nutrient quality of the soil, we recommend mixing in the compost, worm castings, EM1, and planters too. This will further balance your soil. Mackin Organic Compost provides a slow releasing fertilizer, a live soil amendment, it adds organic matter and increases the biological activity of the soil, which also improves soil <laughs> tilth and structure. Worm castings, go ahead. Um, Jillian, what's EM1? I'm getting to that. Oh, okay, yep. thank you. It's, uh, and it's a microbial 
Um, and that also stimulates the life in the soil. So I'll get to that point as well. Worm castings are another similar alternative to EM1, but I use them in conjunction. Worm castings provide a natural source of plant growth hormones, enzymes, and microbes that help to produce vigorous plants with disease and insect resistance. EM1 is a microbial inoculant that is naturally fermented, and it's a live microbial blend of beneficial food-grade microorganisms. This improves soil structure and drainage, and enhances beneficial bacteria in the soil, thus promoting plant growth. EM1 also breaks down and neutralizes toxins in the environment. And from my research with EM1, and from Lee, who used to work here and actually trained me, he told me that if you remember the um, oil spillage in the Gulf, uh, that was actually cleaned up with a similar formula to EM1, but that didn't make the news. So it's interesting to think, but it has a really great um, ability to break down and neutralize toxins in the environment, whether it's in soil or water. So a lot of people use it in soil mixes. Some people give it to their animals. Some people even drink it. I don't recommend that. I'm just recommending it for soil use, which is what it's designed for. But it's very, very effective. <laughs> Planers 2 is a natural trace mineral mix that balances the soil and improves soil health, thus lessening the need for other fertilizer corrections. Lastly, vermiculite, which is the big bag in the corner there, improves aeration of the soil, enhances drainage, adds permanent soil conditioner, slightly raises the pH, and makes other minerals more readily available to plants. Does anybody have any questions on those so far? Does that make pretty good sense? What's the seagull eye on? The quar. Yeah. So that is this bale right in front here. It's condensed coconut, basically, so it's the fiber coming off the coconut. Um, and it's, it, it replaces peat moss. So instead of using peat moss, you use that, and it has much better qualities than peat moss. And everything, if you look at the soil that I sent around, the majority of what's in that is the guar. And when you get it, it's, it comes in this block size here. Uh, it's compressed. And what you do is you take at least six gallons of water and soak it in that. And you'd be surprised how fast it expands. Um, we put it in my office downstairs in a big old bucket and added five or six gallons to it just to see what would happen. And it, it was pretty much done expanding in about three hours. So we let it continue to sit and everything so it would continue to expand that moisture throughout. But I'd go in every now and then and kind of break apart the chunks. Um, and it turned into this really, really healthy um, beginning of soil. Anyway, because I added compost and everything also. I used a trash can to do mine. Mm -hmm. My dirty gallons. Yeah. Yeah. Some people do um, trash cans, some do wheelbarrows, um, or if they have, like we used was a big old coconut drum, or it was an oil drum, I'm not sure what was in that originally, but um, we just cut that in half and, and put the guar in there and that seemed to work. So any sort of large container that you can get that does expand about five to six times the size of that. Kelly, what's the approximate cost of everything up there, like a four by four square, like how much would it cost? Of? Um, I believe it's around, I think I, I think I calculated it at $100 okay. um, to make your mix, and that's more than enough to fill a 4x4 garden and have some left over. Okay. So, what do you mean by fill? With, uh, how many inches? They have about six inches of soil. Six inches and a 4x4. Four four. Mm -hmm. Now, could you mix that with what you already have, absolutely. or you don't recommend that? You absolutely could. The only thing I'd say if you're mixing it with other materials, you know, try to um, gauge it by what you have already. If you're already doing your compost, et cetera, that's great. Um, but I would start this mix well before you start planting so that you can make sure that it's balanced. You can do a soil test on it um, or just see how it's doing. You know, usually you can smell it and kind of get a feel for um, if something's off. And so you, you can certainly mix this with anything you already have. Um, but this is more just a starter mix for somebody that only has clay, you know, to work with and it's hard to get that production up. Um, so this is more just to get you started. So you said start early, what do you need? So you want to, I recommend at least a month, um, if not a little bit more. I mean, if you're doing your own compost, usually that's done in production much longer, over a period of six months or more. Um, so that by the time spring comes, you're ready to use it. It's you know, been neutralized enough and then everything's mixed together thoroughly that it's ready to go into your garden and it won't potentially burn your plants if it's too high in nitrogen. 
So maybe it's not good to use that mix to start seeds because it's too too strong. This one? No, this one's fine for starting seeds. Oh, okay. Because mm -hmm. the compost isn't. I mean, the compost is ready to use, and it's the quantity in this mix isn't enough with the coir. Um, it's not enough to cause any issues. So the square foot gardening method, which I'll get to as well, talks about using one third compost, one third peat moss, and one third vermiculite. Um, so that's in whatever quantity you're trying to make for your soil, but they use compost for it and they've never had issues. So every, everybody that I've read that has followed the square foot gardening method has had very, very successful gardens. And there's a whole lot of um, videos online as far as how to do it, and we'll get, we'll get to a certain part of that where I'll show a little clip. Um, but Mel Bartholomew is the author of the Square Foot Gardening Method, and he has several different books that are really, really great reads and very helpful. I mean, they cover the bare basics and they go very extensive after that point. So to get started, there's about six steps to keep in mind before you start gardening. The first one is to find your garden beds. The second is to plan out your garden crops and what you're looking to actually produce. Um, you need to define your goals for your garden. Then decide whether or not you're going to utilize a greenhouse and to what extent you're going to use your greenhouse. Whether you're just going to use it to start your seeds or continue production throughout, or if you prefer to direct sow in your garden. The fourth step is transplanting and ma maintenance of your garden after you put your seedlings in. The fifth step is harvest, which we all love if it works. <laughs> The sixth step is continuous planting, which we'll actually have a class on that next month, March 26th, and I'll give a recap of everything on that at the end of this lecture, um, and also mention who our guest speaker will be for that. To begin gardening, first decide where you will build your garden and how big you'd like your garden area to be. The square foot gardening method has four spacing guidelines for inside your box. There's extra large, large, medium, and small. And you can see the spacing requirements on here. It's also in the handout. These are based on the spacing required per seed type, which can be found on the back of your seed packets. Next, decide on what materials you'd like to use to define your garden space. These can be any non-treated six inch wide lumber or similar material. Weed barriers are wonderful tools to use at the base of your garden, especially if gardening over a lawn area. Next, decide on where your garden will be located. Keep in mind that proximity to houses or fences may cause certain areas of the garden to overheat as heat will reflect off of the fencing or off the side of the house and can really scorch your tomatoes if you put them too close. I found that out the hard way. Once your garden frame is built, add in whatever soil materials you're choosing to use. As I mentioned, the square foot gardening method you already have and then just cultivate that over about a month if not a little bit longer just to make sure that everything's uh, well-rounded in that soil. Additionally, I also provided a handout on the elements and tools needed to create your own healthy soil. And that pulls largely from uh, Harvey Ussery. He is a poultry expert and kind of does horticulture and everything with his poultry. So he's a wealth of information on that and had some really great materials on Mother Earth News. So they have all of their articles online as well. You can certainly search for anything on that. And a lot of those experts have contributed really great articles on gardening, on greenhousing, on just about everything horticulture you can imagine. So once your garden bed is established, decide how you want to group your intended crops. I provided a companion planting list to give you an idea of which crops work best or worse together. This is just an estimation on various gardeners' experience. There is no science proving that this works. It's more just what people have found to be effective using natural mechanisms for pest control and disease control. The best advice that I can give you is that the first steps of gardening are more like trial and error, and you have to find what works best for you and for your soil. So as you mentioned, you're from Illinois. It's gonna be very different than Virginia soil. So finding what works best with your gardening techniques in new soil types um, and what, what you're trying to, to meet your goal for, you know, that's what you have to focus on. And so no gardening plan is gonna be identical. There's always gonna be different advices that people will give you as far as what they've found that works, what they think doesn't work, but it might work in a different area. So just kind of play around with it and, and figure out what works best for you. I recommend designing a planting chart with a hypothetical garden plot prior to planting your crops. This way you can arrange your crops easily and visualize where everything will be prior to getting in the dirt. Here are some examples that I designed for a 4-H record book when I worked for extension. This planning chart designates the crop, variety, 
spacing between plants and rows, days to maturity, seeds per individual square foot, and the last recommended planting date. Keeping these specifics in mind is important for continuous harvest throughout the gardening seasons. As you can see, there's different spacing. Beets only require two inches, whereas collards are 18 to 24 inches apart. Um, garlic is four to eight inches, but kale is 12 to 15 inches. So you have to keep that spacing in mind, especially as you're square foot gardening. And we'll get to that as far as how you would decide how many seeds you need per square foot. Um, but the square foot gardening method is designed to be able to fluctuate with a chart like this. <clears throat> this is a hypothetical garden that I created, and it's designed to be a 16 foot by 10 foot garden with companion planting in mind. Garlic is planted with borders of onion, kohlrabi, and beets because all of these interact well with the other. Garlic repels aphids, white flies, Japanese beetles, root maggots, and ermine moths. So it's a great pest control for these three companions. Onion is also really great. It deters most pests, which I imagine because it you know, got such a strong smell, <laughs> things don't really want to bother it. Um, this, but it also is really great at repelling maggots. As you work to group your plants, though, keep in mind that not all plants are good companions. Kohlrabi, for example, should not be planted near tomatoes as it'll stunt tomato growth. Once your garden plants are in place, decide whether you will sow seed directly into the soil or transplant seedlings. For this section, I'll focus on sowing directly into the soil. An easy method for establishing your garden squares is to use stakes and twine to define the deep straight rows. It's very simple. Once your areas are established, follow the directions on the seed packets to determine the spacing you need between plants. Then make your seed pools according to these spacing recommendations. I provided a little video to demonstrate. Yeah. Each one foot square is planted with just one type of crop. Across your raised bed, it's recommended that you plant each square with different crops and companion planting flowers. So in this four feet by four feet bed, you could plant 16 different crop types. To keep the planting simple, there are no plant spacings to remember. Instead, each square has either one, four, nine, or 16 plants in it, depending on the size of the plant. Easy to position in each square by making a smaller grid in the soil with your fingers. It really is that simple. In square foot gardening, you use just a small pinch of seeds in each planting space, usually two or three seeds. With this approach, you use less seed than you would if you were using traditional methods. And you can see on that too that they just gently pushed it down because they built their own soil using materials similar to this. So it's very pliable, very easy to use, um, and you don't have to worry about compacted soil either. Um, so all they did when they made their little holes, they stuck their finger there, put a few seeds in, and then pushed it down gently and left it. Um, it's very, very effective. The alternative option to, is to utilize a greenhouse to start your seeds prior to the last frost. Finding the right balance of light, water, air circulation, and nutrition is incredibly important and essential to successful seed starting. There's a wide variety of greenhouses to select for your growing needs some of which include electricity, heat, workbenches, shelving, and lighting. I've included a list of greenhouse options ranging from high-end purchases to do-it-yourself options. The best thing you can do is to draw out your gardening plans prior to making this decision to ensure that you gather all the materials you'll need. Whichever option you choose, make sure you understand how to operate that ventilation system. Temperature and humidity are some of the hardest things to control in a greenhouse. The temperature should remain around 70 degrees and no higher than 85 degrees, depending on the selection of plants you choose. Humidity should be kept around 50% or higher and can be controlled by placing trays of pebbles with water underneath your planting trays. Many gardeners also utilize pebbles on the floor, under the tables and benches, as these can be moistened to also increase humidity in the room. However, pest control is also very crucial as the greenhouse is a warm and inviting place for critters of all kinds. I mean, when it's below zero uh, in Blacksburg, where I used to live, the greenhouse is about 75 degrees, and I'm going there all the time. <laughs> it's pretty warm. So as I've mentioned previously, companion planting is a great way to control those pests. Um, once you see them, though, make sure that you are washing your crops so that you can isolate any infected plants immediately and keep the spread from the rest of your crops. 
If you're planning to transplant into your garden, it's best to start your seeds about six to eight weeks prior to the last frost date. For our area, this would be between March 3rd and 17th. So we mentioned if you're doing your own soil work, you should start now, technically, because it's about a month before that time frame. So if you start now with that, you should be about ready to use once you're getting ready to put everything into your garden. Follow the seed packets for specifications. Some large seeds, such as beans or tree seeds, must be soaked in warm water overnight before planting. The next step is to prepare your seed starting trays with your potting soil mix. And as I mentioned, you can use this in the potting soil mixes uh, or in your, your seed trays. Um, some people prefer using the Macanero Light potting mix, which is you know, also fully balanced, and then they usually come back and add some fertilizers and everything. So for some large seeds, I already mentioned, um, you might have to soak them, so make sure that you're following the seed packets uh, specifically. For smaller seeds, you spread a few seeds over the area of the tray cell and then gently press them into the soil as you saw them do in the video. It's the same method in a seed tray. Once you've sown all of your seeds, lightly moisten the soil and place trays in a well-lit area. To encourage faster germination, you can place the trays on a heating mat or another, use another heat source to maintain soil temperature between 70 to 85 degrees. The greenhouse temperature should remain around 70 degrees throughout the day and no lower than 50 degrees at night. Many greenhouse users prefer automated ventilation systems, but ventilation is also easily established utilizing box fans, windows, or doors. Ventilation will also depend on the greenhouse setup and methods you choose to use. I mentioned when some people were filtering in that my parents and I used some of your porch greenhouses, which is just cheap plastic. Um, it tries to trap light as best as possible to keep it a warm environment, and it worked all right. Um, the problem we had is the dog liked to tip it over. So <laughs> you have to make sure if you're using something like that, that you've rooted it in place, that you understand what all needs to be used to maintain that environment. Um, so just really research, research it before you start to use it, because you might run into some problems afterwards. When natural sunlight is less than 16 hours per day, Place your seed trays under um, six inches of fluorescent lights. So you, you put the fluorescent lights in and calculate about a half foot down, and that's where they should be. Any higher could cause them to burn, any lower they'd be too cold. So after the seedlings sprout, there's usually two sets of young identical leaves that appear first. Shortly after, a different leaf appears that looks different from the first sprouts. This is the first true leaf. Your seedlings are ready for larger containers and a half-strength application of all-purpose soluble fertilizer or plant food once they have at least two true leaves developed. At this point, you can elect to continue growth inside the greenhouse at, or choose to transplant them outside. If you elect to continue growth within the greenhouse, keep in mind that spacing throughout your greenhouse is incredibly important for air circulation. And if you choose to transplant, begin transi transitioning your plants outdoors over a two week time frame before the last frost. You wanna expose them to the harsher temperatures outside for about a couple hours at a time and gradually increase that time frame <coughs> until you, at the end of that two weeks. This process is called hardening off. If you don't follow this process, what happens is you'll take your transplants out on a nice sunny day and put it in your garden and then you might have a, you know, maybe not a freeze that night, but temperatures might drop and your plants are very vulnerable at this stage and a lot of your seedlings might die. So this is one that I was mentioning to this gentleman earlier. It's called a wallapini. It's an underground greenhouse and I have no idea how they managed to make it work, but it is awesome. So I wanted to show you this clip to give you an idea of just how many options there are for greenhouse management. They don't have any heating mechanisms in here. They simply use the cover over the, house, over the greenhouse and whatever the soil temperature is, is what they work with.
directly into the hillside. I've seen some companies that have workbenches that they've brought in, but a lot of the users that I've researched just cut into the earth even more and make their own people that way. So I have no idea how they do that, but it's very fascinating. People do that all over the world. Um, I'm not sure where directly this one was, but it's a very, very cool idea. So as I mentioned before the Wallapini video, before you transplant your seedlings into your garden, it's best to follow the process termed hardening off by transitioning your plants outdoors gradually over a two week time frame. During this time period, start prepping your garden bed by amending the soil with compost, minerals, or fertilizer. Some Gardeners, like I said, they prefer to do that about six months prior. Sometimes you can get away with just one month to a couple weeks before, but you definitely don't want to wait last minute before you're putting your seedlings in as your soil will still be too young to maintain your transplants. There are many ways to amend the soil, and the soil handout I provided as guidelines for building fertile soil. Many gardeners recommend that you transplant when the weather is slightly overcast, as light rain and slight cloud cover will help to ease the transfer shock of your plants. Some prefer to plant based on the moon's phase, as many believe that different cycles of the moon affect plant growth. And if you look on Farmer's Almanac and things like that, you can find some really incredible stuff. I don't know much about that, um, but some farmers come in, that come in downstairs, they swear by it. Many gardeners also suggest drenching the plants with a weak solution of fertilizer just prior to transplanting from the pots to the ground. This will help also ease the transplant shock. Kelp-based fertilizers, such as Neptune's Harvest, are an excellent product to use as the kelp encourages root uh, formation and growth and provides 60 or more micronutrients. So a lot of people, I had a customer call last night asking if she could feed kelp to her horses and use it in her garden, and absolutely you can. Um, it has an array of vast nutrient qualities um, for just about every purpose you can imagine. So whether you're using it in your soil or eating it yourself, I've seen a lot of people that eat orthorbic kelp. I can't recommend that because it's feed grade, but um, they swear by it and it's really just an all around great source of nutrition. As you take the plants out of their containers, it's important to push them out rather than pull them out. If you try to pull them out, that might cause breakage of the main stem on the plants and then your transplant won't, won't live. Plants at this age are extremely vulnerable, so just be sure to handle them with care. My own methods of transplanting are to take, make a medium-sized hole in the intended area that I'm going to plant in and place a seedling in its original soil inside that hole. Prior to filling the hole with the garden soil, I usually fill it about three quarters of the way with a diluted fertilizer, and then I carefully fill the rest with the new garden soil. Another gardener that I know, and I mentioned this earlier for some of the people who have just come in, um, she uses an eighth a cup of worm castings, planters two, and calcium shell before she plants anything. She allows the weeds to go rampant in her garden because she says it doesn't bother her. They're not bothering, you know, it doesn't, she won't bother them if they don't bother her. And so she just kind of works around them. And in a sense, that's a natural way to do it as well. The plants will start to build immunity to that. But if she ever does have some invasive weeds that are just trying to take over, she will go in and mainly take them out. But uh, she's also about 86 years old and still garden and strong. So she just utilizes her poultry and everything to maintain that and she just works around the weeds. And her soil test came back pretty much perfect. There was no correction she had to do to the soil. It was all right in the recommended uh, ratios. So it was incredible. I encourage you before you start though to research your soil needs prior to transplanting to determine just what you need, because every soil is different. You know, you go an hour in Virginia and you're different microclimate, different microclimate, different soil type. Some places might have more limestone, some might have more clay. Um, so it's more important to just figure out what you have first and then build from there. The square foot gardening method uses the magic soil mixture that I mentioned with one third peat moss, one third 
compost and one third of vermiculite. Our soil mix suggestion would also fully, be fully balanced for your transplants. But like I said at the beginning, you can use pretty much anything. Just make sure that um, it's been in production. <coughs> you know, it's, it, you've started it early enough that it's not going to cause your plants to burn if the nitrogen's off at all. Lastly, if the weather is looking poor, you can lightly cover your plants with garden netting, upturned flower pots, cardboard boxes, or buckets in order to protect your seedlings from any inclement weather. You should only need to do this for a few days as, their, um, as the root system starts to take hold in the soil. But watch your weather forecast to make sure before you decide to remove all the covers. After this point, you've successfully transplanted your plants. If you prepared a planting chart, such as the one I showed before, fill in the estimated maturity and harvest dates for your various plant types. It's better to keep these dates in mind rather than to be surprised when harvest time comes and you're caught off guard with a very productive garden and you can't keep up with everything. While each crop is different, it's usually best to gather ripe vegetables and fruit as soon as they are ready, as this will encourage the plant to continue producing. One option is to track your garden's productivity is to keep a harvest record similar to this one that I created for my project book. You can see that I listed the vegetable, unit of measure, and then the amount harvested is three different categories, used at home, given away, or sold. And then the next column is total amount harvested, the value of the vegetable, which is based off of your grocery store value for that type. And then that, you calculate the total value based on that, and that'll show you just how much your garden is giving back to you. Um, the slide before that is more for your own reference. It was just uh, the little explanation that I pretty much just gave as far as how to use the chart. And you can certainly put any category that you'd like in there. Just something that helps you track your harvest and plan for next year's garden so that you know what works and what didn't. So uh, you certainly don't need to do all those categories. It's helpful to track expenses, value, and total quantity produced. And there's also a great article um, from Burpee Seeds and Plants on harvesting tips for several varieties of crops. I thought about putting that in here directly, but I don't know what everybody's planning on growing, and there's a wide of things that you could, you could possibly grow. So I figured we could talk about that in the question section. So each of your seed packets would also have harvesting tips as well, so refer to that. And if you get it from a seed catalog, usually they have some gardening tips in the seed catalog as well. So on this slide, I showed continuous planting. So as you're taking these out of your garden, what are you going to plant next? And that's the cool thing with square foot gardening is that it allows you to finish one crop and immediately start another one uh, by using this, the soil mix that you already prepared. You just replace it and continue growing. Um, so next month, March 26th, from 10 a.m. to 12, we'll have a guest speaker. She's a distinguished gardener. Her name is Pam Dolly. She's also an author of Sustainable Market Farming, Intensive Vegetable Production on a Few Acres. And I had the privilege of sitting under two of her classes at a conference last year, and it was incredible. I learned so much from her. Um, so it's a blessing that she's willing to come and, and share that knowledge with us. Um, she's currently an added vegetable grower for almost 40 years, and she's currently working three and a half acres for 100 people and providing training for uh, members in sustainable vegetable production. So I really encourage you to come join us with that. It will be really, really cool, especially given that this talk is now right before it. So it wasn't originally paying that way, but that's okay. So it worked out best. <laughs> but with that, I wanted to um, open it up to questions. And if there's anything you guys wanted me to go back over, I can certainly do so. Um, but then I wanted to give the floor to you guys and try to address any needs that you specifically have. Was your, was your last frost date for this area, because it's a little earlier than I'm mm -hmm. used to hearing. From my neighbors. It was March 16th or 17th, I believe. Yes, What year you is that? The last frost is um, between April 21st to 30th. So the March 16th or 17th is when you would start your seedling. It seems like a lot of my neighbors who are successful think it's in May. Do you think that's? Well, it depends on what you're planting. Yeah. You know, you don't want to put tomatoes no, out. Right. This is also for the Waynesboro area. Maybe so a, a few ways away. Mother's Day is a good thing for plant transplants out. I'm sorry? Mother's Day is a good day. It is. It's, yeah. Depends on what you're doing. 
But it also depends on your area. Like I said, yeah. you have an hour, and it's a different microclimate. So right. this is based off the Waynesboro area. So um, there was another example given that I researched that was in the same state, but um, two hour difference, and it was about a month difference in transplant date. So um, the last frost can vary if you're born in mountains region or in the valley. So just Farmer's Almanac usually has some pretty good speculations for that, but you really just gotta watch your weather. You can plan uh, based on the Farmer's Almanac or other sites that might have that approximation, the weather channel, whatever. Um, but then when it actually comes time to that date to transplant, I would just base it off the weather temperatures that you're seeing. If you're seeing consistent above 65 degrees, then, or 60 to 65 degrees, I should say, then go ahead. You know, it's, it'll be fine if the temperature start to warm up. But if it's still sporadic, I'd hold off and wait. I have my own compost, sort of. I, mean, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've just been throwing stuff <laughs> um, Is it better to test the pH of that before you start mixing other things with it, or mix it all together and then test it? Adjust. You could certainly test it ahead of time if you'd prefer. Uh, like I said, the soil tests here are only twenty dollars. It's pretty cheap to do so, and you get a very expansive um, record back as far as what you need to do for that. And you would also specify this is compost. Um, so for that, you could also mix it though and go from there. Because like I mentioned with the coir, if you're using something like coir, it maintains a six to six point seven pH already. So if you're mixing it with, you know, maybe more acidic compost, that's going to offset it a little bit. So in my opinion, I would think mixing it all together first and then going from there would be a little bit easier. Anybody else? You can certainly look through the handouts I provided and see if there's anything that stands out to you. Um, there's a lot of material on there, sorry. Um, the companion planting guide's like six pages, but... <laughs> So this mixture, you don't need to do it a month ahead of time, let's say, because it's not, our, it's not going to be hot, right? It's not going to be hot. I still would recommend doing it um, about two weeks before. Oh, you would? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have time, I mean, because it's separate components, so mixing it all together, it still has to kind of reestablish a balance. Um, so mix it and put it where you're going to use it a couple of weeks before? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So not just sitting somewhere in your wheelbarrow or whatever. You could, either way. I mean, once you've, once you've mixed it, I mean, what, I, what I'm probably going to do for my mix is, um, I mean, I'm using what I've already put together, but then adding to that, and I'm just going to go ahead and put it in a big mound and cover it with a tarp, and then go from there. So there's, I mean, there's a variety of methods you could do, find what works best for you, but if you do at least two weeks beforehand, that gives everything time to be acclimated to the other components. So you don't want it to rain on it. You could. I mean, the rain's not going to hurt it. Just if you, I mean, we've had some really, really hard rains lately, and my concern is that it would wash away if I'm not putting it in a structure. So um, for some of these, you know, when you have the leftovers, you can certainly put it in a sealed container, and that's what we're going to do for um, some of our leftovers. Uh, and if you're not starting from scratch, if you already have some raised beds, then you would bring soil in and then learn what to add to it, or just put that on top, or? You can mix it in. Um, it's not going to harm it at all. And if you already have soil in place, in my opinion, that's the best thing to start with uh, because it's already native to that environment. So you start with what you have. You can certainly add these. It's not going to hurt it. Um, and then you know, do a soil test to see where you're at and go from there. But if you're doing your own compost, uh, what I've found on our farm specifically, we have a more biologically diverse um, square foot garden than I will this year because we have used uh, leftovers from goats, swine, chickens, all of that, and vegetables, and I think horse manure next door, and all of the things that we've just mixed together in this massive compost bin, um, along with our other organic matter, such as leaves, pine, pine leaves, and things like that, or pine needles, and um, we've mixed all of that together in our compost bin areas. And we have several different ones that we use. Um, we have one of those that you turn, but unfortunately the lid doesn't stay on very well, so we just mix it with a shovel. It's turning it, it's a disaster. <laughs> so instead, we used pallets to build our compost bins. So we had three in a row, and we did you know, the, the back way and the sides, and then just a divider in between those to, to make three sections. And we put all of what was once in that compost container, you know, our, our raw materials that we started out in there, 
we'd dump into those compost bins and then we would transition them you know into the other components and so when we cycled out of the first bin into the second bin we'd bring in the stuff from the compost bin again and we just continually kept mixing it and by the time i reached the third bin it's ready to use so some people also will cover it with a black tarp because that will trap heat even more and cause it to break down a little bit faster i think you had a question yes in the um, video you, uh, it showed a grid like a wooden grid mm -hmm. um, is that that important and also in that video it looked like they have a netting over it maybe for pests or something i don't know it might have been just for because they were still preparing their soil um okay. i think that was just more for protection before they began but I can certainly go back to the video, this one here. Um, let's see. So in, inside of their, inside of this, they use that just for their own guidelines for the square foot. You don't have to use wood. You could certainly use uh, twine or something. And once you've gotten in place, you don't have to leave the twine there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Using it for a plant. Yeah. Yeah. Like what they're and doing. you would just do that for for a little while until they get established. I guess. Yeah. It's it's more gardener specific. I mean, whatever they chose to do, it, it varies. Okay. Um, that's the first that I've seen people use the netting. Actually, I didn't even notice that the first time I watched the video. Um, Where is the netting? If you go back to the beginning here, you're going to see the birds Yeah. Yeah. So just leave that on for a little while. Point. Yeah, you don't have to do the spacing as they did it, like with the wood pieces. You just use twine. It works really easily. So you can see the netting here um, over the sides there. But I'm, I'm guessing they just did that as a start um, to keep whatever critters on their farm out of it. Yeah. But this this guideline, I mean, it's it's you can use little pieces of wood if you prefer. But in my opinion, it's easier to use twine because if you mess up, you can just lift it and move it and do whatever you want with it. Um, it's very simple, and we just tack it down with a push pin. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I tried companion planting a little bit um, this last year, and uh, I'd love to hear from anybody here who is doing something with that and what kind of successes you've had and what you've done. If, uh, I thought it, I thought it worked particularly with flea beetles on um, eggplant, um, parsley. I can't it seemed, it seemed to help, uh, but I also use some of that dust that you guys sell. The um, um, yeah, I forget what it's called, garden dust or something. Garden uh, dust. But so anybody, I'd love to hear what anybody has done with companion planting. We found companion planting really cut down on our squash beetles. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have very unsuccessful squash vines <laughs> um, until we started, you know, research and grouping things together. And when we did that, it was a lot healthier. We got more production, even with our zucchini too. Um, our tomatoes, we had an issue for a while, and I think that was more because we just had a mass quantity of tomatoes everywhere. My mom decided to grow like 30 or 40 different varieties. Um, so <laughs> that was uh, quite a lot of different transplanting out of the square foot garden by the time that was done. Um, but when we really cracked down on the groupings, and in, in the sheet that I provided, um, there's like 45, 46 crops covered. Um, there's the, the ones that I put on there uh, from other gardeners, they swear by it. And some of them I've had success with. Um, I haven't grown alfalfa, I think that one's on there. I haven't tried doing that. Um, but legumes are really great as well because they're nitrogen fixers, so. Is there anything that helps with squash line borers? Yes, let me, let me myself copy. Is there another one back there? While you're looking for that, um, I gave up on zucchini and summer squash and all that until this last summer I planted the tromboncino. Um, it's, a, it's a summer winter squash, really. It's the best thing I've ever tasted. It's better than, than the yellow squash and zucchini together. Uh, and it grows, it grows it, the word comes from trombone in Italian, and it grows this long with this uh, big bulb at the end. But when it's young and you uh, you cut it up for uh, just summer squash, it's delicious. 
So um, if anybody has trouble with squash bugs and squash borers and all that stuff, it come again? I recommend they don't touch it. They didn't touch it. And uh, uh, it was the best thing, you know, ever. Uh, Trombonsino. Um, I got it from, um, uh, you know, the uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I kept them for winter squash. They, they could have kept us. Yeah, I've been spraying squash from it. And they're, they're really germinates good. to keep the borers off. As soon as it pops up out of the ground, spray every seven days. But most of y'all are organic, so. <laughs> well, the color method is marigolds. I love marigolds. Marigolds. Yeah, yeah. I plant them between my tomatoes. Um, between each set of tomatoes, I plant um, marigolds, and I haven't had. And I've done that for four years now, and I've had no aphids or tomato worms on any of them. And I swear by them. Marigolds are wonderful. Yeah. I plant them all, all around. around. In between each tomato plant, I plant. What about basil? Do you do that? Basil. You can certainly plant it near basil, it's not going to harm it. Um, or marigold or is one of those things that it doesn't have a negative impact on anything. So, and geraniums is another one that I will plant those in pots, just move them. Right down, the as soon as they start yeah. coming in. But the marigolds are not as well. For marigolds also, it also will control your squash bugs. So your squash vine borers, squash beetles, anything like that, like it'll it'll control that. Okay. Beetles, aphids, potato bugs, squash bugs, and maggots kills nematodes, repels white flies, and also repels rabbits. They do not like marigolds. So hmm. we had a rabbit problem until our cat took care of it. You know, I, I grow eggplant, and I, I grow all sorts. I love it, and I use roll covers. Uh -huh. From the beginning, That'll work. and they they do great. Great, yeah. which is what the ground covers. What do you mean? A lot of row covers. I row use row covers, just very light matting on my eggplant, and they keeps the flea. It keeps the flea beetles yeah. off. Physical uh, mm -hmm. barriers. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Idea. Idea. And later on, when they get big, I just let the bugs add them because you, they, they're they're healthy enough yeah. that they yeah. you know. Yeah. But, Especially when they're in the transplant stage or the young stage. Um, but physical barriers are always your best prevention. So if, if you're following organic control, I mean, certainly there's a lot of pesticides you can use if you're not organic. Um, I personally move against pesticide use that work for organic companies. Um, but your physical control, you do your netting, or um, they do make insect pest netting um, that has, you know, it's small, like, small enough netting that even your small flea beetles can't get through it, but light still gets through it. That's the important thing, is making sure whatever you use, mm -hmm. your light and air will still flow through. Because um, you don't want to like cover it with tarp, per se, because it's not going to be very good. Um, but there was a gentleman that came in uh, last summer who has dwarf orchards, um, and so he does all sorts of different you know, trees, and um, the only pest problems he had was with his non-dwarf apple trees because he couldn't reach them to do organic <clears throat> control and it was just you know bug heaven there um because he, he couldn't he didn't have you know the 30-foot ladder to get up into this tree and try to control it that way but his dwarf trees he just put netting over them and so that physical barrier was perfect so the more you can do with that the more physical hand removal you can do i've had a lot of questions about weed control um, organic weed control and unfortunately there aren't very great options. You can try burnout. Burnout is one that um, will kill the foliage, but it doesn't kill the root system. So repeated applications will start to weaken that plant, but the best thing you're still going to have to do is go in with a spade and take it out. So another thing that I mentioned with square foot gardening that's so great is that you can put down a weed barrier and just plant on top of that. <laughs> and it's a lot easier. Yeah, we, um we have um, someone that provides leaves for us where we know that they're health, you know, I guess healthy leaves. There's not yeah. a lot of chemicals on them. But once we plant and the plants are established, I put leaves in between all of my rows. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have any. The first year I used straw, and that was stupid. I had to go back through and put newspaper underneath there because it just promoted yeah. weeds. But from now on, I use um, leaves. And I don't. It, it's cleaner for, you know, picking. And I don't have any weeds. Well, the, the, the thing with that, too, the reason it works is because the leaves are already dead. Yeah, um, There's no the seeds them. on yeah. that, so it's just you're adding organic matter back yeah. to that soil. Yeah. Whereas with straw, there's potential seeds that's going to germinate right. in, and it's going to start producing yeah. yeah. straw. And these are pretty, um, they're pretty chopped by the time I get them, so they don't blow off anywhere. It's just a nice, 
Everything goes in my house. Yeah. I all that stuff and it's gone. My family raises Nigerian dwarf deer goats, and so every year we take those large contractor bags and we fill them up with leaves. Um, so my goats have potato chips throughout the year when it's, there's nothing blooming. And um, we also, whatever's left over that they haven't devoured, we put that in the gardens. Yeah. So. <laughs> but another good thing that you can do too, um, a lot of people will use newspaper, recycled papers or anything, and they'll put that down, yeah. and then they'll cover it with plastic, because that will, again, trap heat. Um, eventually you do have to remove the plastic because it's not going to disintegrate. Um, but that's, that's another form of a weed barrier. And before I started using the leaves, it seemed like I had to water more. And this keeps the moisture in, and the dirt's a lot softer underneath, so it, it's really made a huge difference. So do you put it in between every plant too, or just in your rows where you're walking? Um, completely throughout the whole completely. garden. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so like if I have a row, like I usually have two rows of beans, yeah. and so I'll put, you know, in between. And sometimes the beans are not established enough to when I put the leaves in, so I just keep them back until I hoe it up around them and all, and then I'll just pull the leaves all in around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people will do their rows like that, and again, they'll cover it with um, gardening plastic. And they'll go in and they'll cut a hole large enough to put their seedling in, and that way it's going to keep things from getting in and getting out. So right. it's, yeah, it's not necessarily the best method. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, depending on what you're growing. But it certainly helps keep a cleaner area to work with. It does. That's also a nice thing. Don't worry about the plastic. You always worry about water when you do that. I mean, I guess there's a little teeny area around. I mean, it keeps the weeds. It is going to be more intensive management. I mean, I guess it's probably useless to. When you do that, you have to water it directly on the base of the yeah. plant. That's a trip irrigation. That's another one too. You can do trip irrigation, but another thing um, that's helpful if you take, you know, if you if you've eaten canned goods and you have a surplus of that in your recycle bin, or if you go to a recycling facility and you get those cans, um, cut the top and bottom off. Uh, well, obviously the top's already gonna be off, but cut the bottom off of that and stick it into the dirt. And then you just fill up those cans. Yeah, um, slowly release. Yeah. 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 That was sort of a gardening fail because um, our tomatoes ended up. I think there was a one of the first slides. Oh, come on, computer. Oh, was that your tomatoes? <laughs> it wasn't mine, but it was very close to what they looked like. So if you can see, let me expand on this. If you can see these ones, they looked. It looked more like this one, but burned and scorched and cracked at the top because the heat was radiating off of the barn and on top of the plants, and it was just too much for them. So no matter how often we filled those little cans, it was always super dry soil. So when we moved them into our square foot garden, which is behind our house and well enough away from the house, they flourished. And it's easy with that. We have um, tomato plant food that we use. We dilute it. Um, we also sell virtual tomato grower downstairs as well and you just dilute that and it's a great you know little boost to them and you just fill that i think we only did that once a week if that you know when they're in high production phase we'd start giving a little bit to help support the system of the plant and uh then other the rest of the day we just did water so you surround your tomato plant with lots of cans is that what you're saying or just like one can per no just one can and that, that's, yeah. that's enough mm -hmm. we usually do it between two so just one in the middle um, and then continue that way. And so between, you know, depending on how you have the rows set up. Uh, but we also did, when the year that my mom planted like 40 different varieties of tomatoes, we had to continually keep taking some of those out because it was like reseeding everywhere. And um, it was just tomato jungle in our garden. And so we had to take it out and put it in those big five gallon buckets. And then we just put one per bucket. So we were giving away tomatoes at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Using the containers or just the six inch soil, I assume you can't really do potatoes, right? I mean, does anybody you can. Mm -hmm. just, um, just... You can certainly go deeper if you prefer, mm -hmm. but um, the way it's explained, if you think about carrot depth, carrot depth is approximately the same as potato depth. Potatoes, depending on what you're growing, can sometimes be a little bit deeper, uh, and you can certainly add a few extra inches. Um, but you're really only, if you think about the soil horizons, you're really only, you know, if there's your organic matter at the top, 
beneath that soil horizon A, and beneath that, which is the E for some reason, um, mm -hmm. but you're only in those first three sections. And beneath that, you pretty much don't touch the soil. So square foot gardening teaches you to utilize just that top part. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the bottom part is what is gonna start creating its own organic matter that will eventually come up to the surface. So. Mm -hmm. Has anybody done potatoes in containers? I was going to I had a tub. I've tried it two years in a row now. You, know, starting, you start with a little bit, and then as the, the plants grow, you put more. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know that. I mean, I kind of more trouble than it was worth, but I'm just wondering if anybody yes. has a good success with that work would make it worth it. A couple of things. I remember my granddad would always take, instead of like, you know, kind of that can, mm -hmm. he would always take the end of like a shovel mm -hmm. and make holes all the sapless plants and the hope they actually stay yep. they do to fill with water i remember seeing mm -hmm. him do that he would you know just it, would he irrigate or he would mm -hmm. it, it does aerate. yeah <laughs> is that the right way and aerate the soil it also yeah. provides but also mm -hmm. the water would stay um and then a couple things a few years back i just wanted to try the potato thing so it said to lay down cardboard so you know i lay down cardboard mm -hmm. and then seed potatoes and then straw and then as they grew you just keep and it worked. Is that, that what that's called? Uh, it's just you don't they're not underground right. they're just above ground mm -hmm. and it really mm -hmm. cool. then you can just do a lot reach of things in. Mm -hmm. straw bales. Yep. Yeah. So you could reach yeah. it. The thing you have to be careful with that is just making sure the straw itself doesn't get moldy from overheating um, or potentially combusting if it's in too hot of an area. I only did it the one year. Yeah. Just it does work to have anything else to do. <laughs> 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 because big livestock waterers, um, by the time those wear out and crack, you can find them in some places if you're connected well with local farmers etc you take one of those and put potatoes in those i've seen people do that oh, yeah. or in tires you stack you get one tire, tire stack them about this high <laughs> and you do the same straw method um, so, um I was, what is your opinion though on the tires and the rubber leaching oh i mean yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> um, I, it just, I don't know i've seen I've mixed never. mixed reviews on that as far as people's concern i personally i really <laughs> want to try it <laughs> i don't want to fix it myself but i'd be willing to give it a shot um, just because it's it's a source to use. I mean, if you're, I can understand the potential contamination with that, but I don't think it's as high of a risk if you're doing it yearly. You know, you're cleaning them after each use. I don't really see how it would be a huge effect. If you're trying to go organic, though, I don't know what the laws would be on that. It might be an issue. So if you are certified organic, I check with your certifier and see if that's allowed. Um, but certainly, like I said, using those big old livestock waterers, those things are awesome for growing stuff in. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Like how many, like you know, if you were doing the raised beds and you had like a four by eight bed, how many tomatoes would you put in that bed? Like it depends on the variety, but um, I think you can plant four in a square foot. Um, wow. Or maybe it's one per square foot. I, well, I, 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 I was picturing the, the area. No, that was one square foot that we did it in. So it's one per square foot. So your ones that are, but your ones that are going to grow up. Um, same with beans and things like that. You can use the tomato growers, uh, which are like the wire cages, and place it over it. So, but yeah, that was that was a dumb comment on my part. It is one per square foot, and um, you can use the cages to help support it, so it's not knocking into the one next to it. Um, so if they might need to like. Feet apart, and they were encroaching on each other. Really? Yeah. yeah. You have to use determinate tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Do they have yeah. a difference between yeah. determinate and indeterminate? Probably not. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> um, but I do know with, like I said, the year that we had a surplus of tomatoes, um, our issue was probably that we followed the four in the one foot, which was a bad idea, and that's why we had to take some out and transplant them elsewhere, because they did get too big. But when we started using the tomato cages and teaching them to grow upwards rather than out, that was a huge help in space. So. Did you want to um, comment on what you just mentioned? Well, in my operation, uh, I use all the terminate tomatoes. That's one I only do about three feet. Mm -hmm. They're easier to pick. But there's difference in determinate too. Some of them are bred where they're almost an indeterminate tomato. So you have to look at the variety. Like um, celebrities of determinate that you can find around. Mm -hmm. You plant them up to uh, 
24 inch between each one because you got to have air movement through exactly. there. If you yeah. don't, you get disease problems. There's a little bit more to it. Than so the best thing I can recommend going back to that planning chart, um, you can see the spacing on here um, is very different. And so you really have to refer to just the seat packet itself and go from there. Um, so it'll, for different varieties, whether it's your um, heritage breeds or otherwise, it, it's going to vary from seed to seed. So just check that first and see. But like I said, in the garden that we had, um, how big did you say your garden was? Well, your, your last year, garden. my outside space was like 25 by 75 feet. Okay, but your raised bed that you mentioned? So I haven't made, I mean, I'm debating whether or not okay. to do like with lettuce or carrots or something in raised beds. Versus, okay. um, we, our garden is probably six by eight, if I have that right. And we designated like a quarter of that section for our tomatoes. And we had eight successful plants in that quarter. So however many square feet that was, um, they did really well. Cause like I said, we use those tomato growers and it's really helpful. So we just kind of kept tying them up with twine in little areas to help encourage them to grow the right way. And every now and then you'll get ones that don't cooperate, and then you just move them elsewhere. <laughs> which, um, I never can remember on the determinant versus, which ones can you like sucker and the other ones you don't have determine, to? Determine, you really don't have to sucker? Determine. Okay. But I still sucker them. Yeah, yeah, okay. Up to the first bloom. Right. For the determine, in the determine you forget it. There's one go anyhow. <laughs> I got them in my greenhouse right now. Um, in the tournaments that are probably eight feet tall with tomatoes on my head. <laughs> so the determinants are the ones that you... That's what I would put in a raised okay. bed and that's what I do in my field production all the tournaments. I don't pull with in the tournaments. So the end of the tournaments are the ones you have to sucker? Is that what you're yes. Okay. But some people don't sucker. That's just a... What is suckering? But if you don't, then you have so much plant and then yeah. you can't, they don't... That was totally yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't it's basically pruning it back. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. You, you I should use the word turn. sucker. That's a farm and I should say yeah. pruning. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. but you are. I mean, you're just pulling in between so that everything goes yeah. up. But you don't want to do too much because then you'll have too much shade and then you'll have your yeah. plants. You have less fruit when you uh, prune too. Right. It cuts right. the production down. Mm -hmm. I can never. But you have better fruit because it allows it to go to the. And it's bigger. <laughs> yeah. It's it's bigger. Bigger. And it's worse. It's worse. You really have to plan your pruning wisely um, right. because I remember one year we almost lost our raspberry bush when. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which parent decided to go and do it, so I'm not going to name names, but um, <laughs> one of them went out and was like, this is getting too big. I'm going to prune it back. And it had like the best crop it would have had yet and then it was gone so the next year it did all right but it took a couple years to get it back up to the point that it was so. it, though, that's it like is we were talking about the what 86 mm -hmm. year old she probably she's been doing this since she was like five yeah so she's she's, she's had eight years of her garden i will be interesting you need to bring her in for a talk i would love to she's hysterical her name is dolly she's from new york she's got a thick accent she's just a doll to work with she's just hilarious <laughs> I, I reference her a lot. <laughs> and what was the, um, what did she use again? What was the, you, you said the mix that she uses? She does about an eighth a cup of worm castings, an eighth a cup of planters too, and an eighth a cup of calcium shell for her area that she's working in. Oh. Yep. Okay. What was the so if she's got, like, if she's, if she's got an area that's got, you know, four or five plants in a, in a you know, little area, I'd say a couple square feet, that's what she's mixing into the soil. Um, some of them, she does directly all of that into the one mix. So could you do that if you're like planting a tomato plant? Could you mix those amounts into the soil before you put the plant in? You could, yeah. Nice? I mean, like I said, it's trial and error for her that works in her garden. Um, and she was showing me, and she doesn't always do it a full eight cups, sometimes it's a little bit less than that. Um, but she just kind of plays it by ear from what she's learned over the years. And, her garden is super, super healthy. Mm. The more minerals and everything you can get back in the soil and help support that microbial life, the better. So. And you said she's local? She's from where my family's from. So she's a couple hours away. Oh, okay. Uh, you, you do that, that's your fertilizer, that's what you do at transplant or all throughout the season? That was just what one gardener does in her garden. Um, she, for everything that she plants um, in certain sections, I'm not sure the exact spacing, some things, she does all of those 
uh, you know, an eighth of each for just that one, depending on what she's doing. And then if she has some, you know, smaller pots that don't necessarily need that quantity, she mixes it around that space. So it's it's whatever has worked for her garden. But she, like I said, she also leaves the weeds and everything. She says it doesn't bother her, and she just works around it. So it's hilarious. <laughs> It's really great though, kind. Okay. So the number of seeds per hole, and as a state, we're putting a number of seeds. Is mm -hmm. that kind of a standard for just anything you're planting? Usually, because okay. with your seeds, I mean, it, it varies by the type that you're trying to grow, um, but sometimes you get seeds that won't germinate. So by planting a couple, you can pretty much guarantee at least one of them's gonna germinate. And if you get a couple of different ones coming out, you just transplant it out. So you just separate them. You want them to okay. <laughs> Um, last year, I tried this thing that I saw online, taking a bucket. You like to experiment? Um, I do. I just finally got a space where there's garden you know, in the last couple of years. So, um, I actually took one of those cat litter buckets and drilled holes near the bottom on the sides, put some compost in it, and then water your tomatoes with that. You have a tomato in each corner. It really didn't make a difference when I did it, you know, compared to the other tomatoes. And I wonder if anybody else has ever tried anything like that. I love the idea of them like here. Yeah, come on, yeah, yeah. Over and over again. Okay. <laughs> That's similar to what you can do with the EM1. Um, it's one ounce per gallon of water, and it, it does the similar thing to a compost tea. Um, a lot of people experiment with that, and it does very well. Because again, it's just, it's almost like a probiotic going into the soil again. So it's just helping to support the microorganisms that are already there and the plant roots that are developing and growing. It just kind of gives them that extra boost. I'm just wondering if it's even worth doing if, you're, if, if you've got your soil prepared ahead of time and it's balanced and all that. With, this, even... with the soil mix, I forgot the one component, which is the EM1, I meant to put that on the display as well, but that is part of the soil mix. Um, so it's doing the same kind of thing as compost tea. So that's just redundant to do the compost. You can certainly do so. I mean, if you're if you're making your compost tea with the compost you already have on your property, I would go that route because, like, again, you're using the natural resources that are already there to your farm. Um, and the, the more you can stick to what's already there, the better. These are just to support what you have. Mm -hmm. So, or if you have straight red clay that is really impermeable and won't do anything <laughs> like a lot of people over Virginia end up with, um, you can certainly do this to get your soil started. Um, cedar shavings, I sometimes will do cedar shavings for the horse and donkey to stand on. What is your opinion on that in the garden? Do they, are they not great for the garden? I couldn't tell you specifically on that. I know cedar in particular is, people go back and forth on that. Um, am I right, Bill, in thinking that cedar's bad for chicks as well? Yeah, so a lot of people that are doing their poultry compost and stuff afterwards, they don't use that because it's bad for their birds. So they'll stick with like pine chips or hemp bedding, things like that. Um, but what I've found with, with even the, the pine shavings that we use in my goat's pens, it doesn't break down as easily. So what we, we only use bare minimum of that for extra absorption in the barn. Uh, so when we're cleaning out everything, we put down a layer of DE to help neutralize odors and everything and kill any toxins that might be there. It just helps to, again, reestablish good bacteria, et cetera. Um, so it's a good natural method to use as opposed to coccidia or things like that, then we'll use bleach. We bleach everything first and let it air out for a couple days and then we go down and put the DE down. And then we'll do a thin layer of pine chips because um, that just helps absorb some of the uh, waste from my goats. And then we'll put down uh, several inches of straw. Um, and it depends on the year too. I mean, if it's, if it's summertime, we don't do as much straw because they're not gonna be in the barn as much, but winter when it's cold, uh, one of my bucks likes to be tucked in at night, and so my parents literally put like five flakes of straw around him, and he just burrows into it. So <laughs> it varies, um, but in my opinion, that those things take longer to break down. So if, if you're doing that, I would stick with like one of those compost bins that you're going to seal and really traps heat really well. That'll help speed it up a little bit. Because they do stay, they do stay big. Yeah. Okay. We've been doing deep composting in our chicken house and. Uh, spraying that EM on it, mm -hmm. um, like once a week or so, once every couple of weeks, to, to help the composting and also helps the smell. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Deep yeah. that EM one. No, the deep composting chicken house. It's when she you sprays it with the EM one. Mm -hmm. Oh, you just leave everything down, spray, just let it come. And put new layer of straw down. And a lot of people do that with the hemp bedding. Um, and if this will work, when this is hooked up, can you still show a video online? 
Yeah. Okay. I'm going to um, pull something up for the hemp bedding as far as how the deep litter works. Um, we'll, be, we'll go down and look at your product downstairs. Yeah, yeah. So you'll be still be open. Yeah, stores open till one. Okay. Yeah. So this is American Hemp, which is off the interface of the Nice to meet Laura. She's the owner of the American Chicken Store here in Raleigh, North Carolina. What's your address here? It's 8825 Westgate Park Drive, Suite 102, Raleigh. So Laura here at the store sells American Hemp, and what we want to show on this video is she's the one that's been taking care of this Carolina coop for the past six months. And I'm glad to hear from you, Laura. You know, what are your thoughts on our coop, the deep litter system, the design, and also how you have incorporated the American Hemp into the deep litter? Well, we've had this coop set up since um, early July of 2014. Um, and we keep chickens at the store out here to show the coop and also show people uh, what they need to know about keeping chickens. Um, we put this hemp in at the beginning of July and we just added slightly to it ever since we started the coop and haven't had to change it at all. Okay, so here's a bed of American hemp. Uh, how many cubic feet will this do? Uh, this is a five cubic foot bag, so we've got 24 here and we've used three quarters. We've probably used about this much in the bag so far. Since July. Since the beginning six of Six months ago. Yeah. Okay, so now what's going to be probably everyone's number one question is how much is this and what kind of value do we get out of this American Hound? Uh, this bag is $29.99. So compared to a bag of pine shavings, when you look at a bag of pine shavings, it seems a lot more expensive, but in the long term, it actually comes up in much more cost of so Much less than that. Uh, we're probably down to about, pound coming on about five dollars a month for what we've had to add to it over the over time. And a bag of pine shavings is about seven dollars. Or versus if you were trying to use pine shavings in the deep layer system, which is doable, uh, one of the biggest benefits as we are seeing is that you don't have to add as much pine shavings. And again, that's how you save money. You know, nearly as much American hemp. What are some other things that you notice your customers have said about it? Uh, well, we've actually had a few customers who have found their chickens have been allergic to pine shavings, and when they get them as chicks, they'll have all kinds of respiratory issues because chickens have a allergic to respiratory issues. It does happen. And we also have problems with people with brew boxes in their homes and the dust of the pine shavings create. And this is wonderfully in the box. Um, so what would you say, just to bullet point all the benefits going right down the list of them? I guess that would call it, it does not smell uh, anywhere near as much as the pine shavings and straw. I was hoping she'd go into more detail about how she sets that up, how she did this video. It's much more absorbent than all of those other uh, alternatives. In fact, this is a video we actually were afraid to put it in the nesting box. American Hemp LLC. It's soft or that the chickens would like something that was a longer time. We saw a bell for 22. We found that hasn't been the case at all, but the chickens... So she said that she got it for 29. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially for broody hens. Broody hens are in the box all the time. That's when you have problems with mites and poultry rice. Great you have all kinds of issues with them sitting in the same place constantly. And something like this, which um, with its antimicrobial properties and non allergenic really helps keep the booty hands in the Right. And then as for the just the deep litter system in general, you know, we often talk about the uh, benefits in the deep litter system, the number one is going to be you just clean out your hen house once a year. You know, nobody wants another chore. And you know, in a way I wish someone would invent a uh, scratch and sniff video because honestly if you get a chance to see a proper setup with the deep litter system, when we talk about no smell uh, there is no smell, and there shouldn't be any smell. And a lot of people are going to think, well, a year's worth of chicken droppings has got to stink. It doesn't. You know, you're going to kind of, you're just going to set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. And right here, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, so if uh, you get a chance, if you're ever in the Raleigh area and you want to stop by the urban chicken or want to stay park drive, you know, come by and see. So essentially, what they're talking about with the deep litter system, um, there's a number of methods you can do for that. This is the site that I went to, it's American Hemp LLC, and we do sell them downstairs. Um, but we also do, we do webinars once a, month, uh, once a week on Thursdays usually, and Pat 
foreman, she's a chicken expert. Um, she, and she's also an author, but she has a lot to say about deep litter bedding. Um, what she does is she also uses like leaves and things and organic matter that she'll put down, where you can say that as well. Yeah, as I say, I've been doing it for a year and I don't buy anything. I just run over leaves from my lawnmower mm -hmm. and put it in there and I have 13 hands in a fairly small coop. It doesn't smell at all. It's yeah. totally amazing. So there's a number of ways you can do it. I only showed that video because I thought they'd go more in depth about how you do it, but you were wrong. Um, but when you're doing it correctly, there's no smell and it's, it's a lifesaver. And for the hemp bedding over pine chips, I used to use pine chips a lot. Um, or recycled newspaper bedding because I also have a guinea pig and that's so expensive to buy. So I switched over to the hemp and I wasn't sure how I felt about it yet. This is when I first started working here. I had never heard of it before. And uh, so I said, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. I clean his pen every month and a half. And I mean, granted, and his pen is only, you know, maybe from that door to about where my display is. Um, it's not a very big pen. And um, I think it's about a 40 inch by 40 inch space is how I, how I designed it for him. And uh, the hemp bedding, you know, I'll just go in every now and then and kind of fluff it up a bit. Um, you can spritz it with water and that activates the absorption mechanism in it. Hmm. But um, what I do for him is if I see any spots that are particularly dirty, I'll scoop it out and replace it. And I've been on the same bale of hemp since last June. So Granted, it's one pig, it's not chickens, but still. <laughs> it's just, it lasts you a long time. So the deep litter bedding for anything is really effective. And there's a lot of materials you can use for that. Are there any other questions? There was one point where you said a third and a third and a third. Mm -hmm. Well, I've already downloaded it all the way. You said that. <laughs> I have a third compost and a third vermiculite, but what would be a third and why? And so the third worm castings. Yes. So the worm castings um, help to provide the, it helps to establish the biome of the soil. So it brings back more microbial activity. Um, so it's just very, very healthy, all natural way of incorporating um, more microorganisms and everything in the soil to help support plant life. Because um, everything that's in that will also partner with, you know, any minerals you have in the soil, such as planters too, if you use that. Um, it's going to help that absorption rate to be better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, that's all I have for you all today. Um, if you'd like to stay and talk after, I'm available. The store is open downstairs as well. Um, we just got in our seed supply as well from Southern Seed Exchange, which is a local seed auction. It's in Mineral, Virginia. And um, we've got everything categorized from beans to turbots to melons to everything, so it's easy to find. Thank you.